Appreciate it. So, all right. Hello, everybody. It's Friday, April 24th. After some technical issues that we had to do, welcome to the Elevate Academy. We are a place for student athletes, their families, anybody who just loves sports to gather, to elevate each other. Um, we bring you some of the best coaches, athletes, business executives, and influencers who can all help you to be the best you can be in everything you do. And we focus on the complete student athlete, mind, body, game, life. And uh, with that, let's buckle up, put your chin straps on, and welcome to the show. We have Pat LaFontaine. Welcome, Pat. Hey, great to be here. Thanks, Dave. So everyone who doesn't know, I have to give you a little intro. Pat's an NHL Hall of Fame player. Um, he's the only player in NHL history to play for all three New York teams in only his career. There have been other players who played for other teams, but he's the only one who played for all three New York teams, Islanders, Rangers, and the Sabres. Um, he's listed as one of the top 100 players of all time, and clearly he's the best American player to ever play the game. So uh, once again, Pat, welcome, and thanks so much for having, having you on the show today. It's great to be on, Dave. Thanks. So listen, I know this is a crazy time. Um, you know, we are isolated. We're in this COVID-19 epidemic, and um, even with all this going on, you know, you're the founder of Companions in Courage. What I'd like to do is give you the opportunity to just let all the listeners know, what is it's CIC, Companions in Courage? What is Companions in Courage? Well, Companions in Courage Foundation started over 20 years ago. Um, it stems back from my playing days, meeting some really courageous young um, children that were, you know, going through difficult times in children's hospitals. And... Um, uh, there was one in particular I would play video games with and developed a, a special bond and relationship. And uh, he was in isolation, um, along with uh, many more kids uh, uh, during that time. And um, the idea came out was that at the time there weren't really high tech playrooms, uh, opportunities for kids to gather, uh, opportunities for them to communicate to their family members, their heroes, their teachers. And uh, out, out of those uh, courageous kids, you know, especially one in particular, Robert Schwegler, um, you know, the, the Companions and Courage Foundation um, uh, was inspired. And so what Companions and Courage does, we've got a, a lot of amazing friends of the foundation, but we build interactive get high-tech game rooms in various children's hospitals around North America. We have 20 rooms to date now. Uh, we wow. impacted, yeah, we impact about 60,000 kids a year. So is that, is that 20 different hospitals? All over North America, yes. And, uh, and we also did a special program with Microsoft, a kiosk program. So kids like Robert Schwegler, who are in isolation, they can't leave their, their rooms. So we actually created the first uh, private um, uh, online gaming network within the lion's den rooms that we built for these courageous kids and these kiosks so that kids could play each other in games and, and create a special experience. And we, we ended up putting 400 of those in 80 different children's hospitals. And so it's always been a mission to, you know, when kids are isolated and kids are going through scary times and um, they're, they're not certain what's happening and it's also their families uh, to create, you know, content, to create communication, to create, playing games and just put a smile on their face and create a special experience. That's amazing. I mean, it really is. And it's, it's awesome that, you know, you partnered with, you know, companies like Microsoft to really think outside the box and to try to help these kids in, you know, who are literally going through a tough time. Now, you know, I was talking to Carl Lombardi, who's one of your board members. And Carl was telling me that, you know, obviously with everything that's going on with, you know, isolation, COVID-19, you guys were doing some other things too recently. Can you tell us? Yeah, more? we, we have, Carl's done an amazing job, Jim Johnson. We're partnered with Google and Cisco. And, um, you know, one of the things we were able to do recently was we responded the second week in March and um, with healthcare workers to, to raise donations for face shields. We were hoping to do a hundred face shields uh, within a short period of time, but within five days, we actually delivered a thousand face shields to local <laughs> area hospitals on one thing. Another thing we've been able to do, Dave, is there's Cisco was able to put forth a, a DX70 video device that has allowed ICUs and maternity wards 
so that, you know, fathers aren't allowed into the, the, the birthing room or, you know, within certain hospital wards that, that would allow them to have, you know, communication and, and a, able to, you know, visually be a part of that experience. And then we've donated uh, Chromebooks. We've created a lot of content uh, where we've, we've created star chats with NHL players. Um, we've um, created, you know, with NHL players, broadcasters, PGA pros. We've even had a great uh, Swiss mountain dog uh, so that kids could have content. We've also created on our, our YouTube channel too, and areas for kids to go on and watch the live, uh, uh, the NASA International Space Station, San Diego Zoo, Smithsonian National Zoo, the aquarium and and and, uh, Pacific, and um in the Pacific in California. So when kids are feeling isolated, we've given them this content and and allowed them to kind of just uh, have that distraction to see what else is going on in the world. The other thing that's really important, Dave, is that the child life uh, you know staff is being uh, ex extremely um, uh, taxied during this. Uh, we know one. Uh, hospital in New York City that had 35 uh, child life staff members and 120 pediatric beds. And as of right now, they're only down to six on their staff. And wow. so and because of the everyone's being virus, redeployed. Yeah, and because of the virus. And, and so we're trying to give those kids extra content distractions, the ability so that the staff members can still go around and really support and help, you know, with therapies, whatever it is that these kids need. So, you know, it's amazing because you give so much credit and we're, we're, we're so uh, blessed with our hospital workers and our doctors and our nurses and, and uh, we're applauding them, uh, but it's at all levels because there's this trickle down where it's affecting all different levels of hospitals, uh, everybody on the front line. So, you know, I think CIC and, and, uh, our, our board and our friends of the foundation are just trying to do whatever we can to help help support this uh, this crazy time we're living in, and uh, just to give some some ease to the hospital workers, the child life uh, workers, and just try to to do our best where we can. Yeah, you know, you you've done an amazing job, and you you really think about it. You know, all the things that you're doing with providing technology, all this stuff, you're way ahead of the game. So what's great about this is to be able to almost, in some cases, repurpose some of this technology that you've put into these hospitals to help other people, you know, who are going through some really tough times. So it's just, it's just amazing. And, uh, you know, hats off to you. You know, one thing I've always said is, is um, you know, I was talking to Don Saladino, um, who was on the show on Wednesday. And one of the things that Donnie had to say about you is he said, you know, listen, as great a player as Pat is, he's a better person. And, you know, yes. I, I, from, from the first day I ever met you, I, I said the same thing. But there's something that's different, I got to be honest, about professional hockey players versus, I've met a lot of athletes in other sports. I'm not saying that there aren't great people, but it just seems to be that with professional hockey players, so many, so many players are willing to give back and they're just approachable and um, just great people. What is it? Well, Dave, that's nice. I mean, listen, I, you, you played lacrosse and uh, I think sports in general teaches humility, uh, it teaches leadership, it teaches teamwork, uh, sacrifice, discipline. Um, I'd like to think I was very lucky um, being raised in sports culture. Um, you know, I think, I think in all sports, there's this great value that it adds. Um, you know, uh, my parents uh, taught us from a very young age, never forget where you came from and always try to help those in need when you can help. Uh, so that was kind of embedded in the culture. And I think values start in the home. School and sports are vehicles to reinforce those values. Um, the, the best players in the game of hockey are the most humble. Uh, it's part of the code of the locker room. Uh, if you get too if you get too cocky or you get too boisterous, um, you're you're humbled the next day or the next night. Um, yeah. But I think in all I think all sports, you know, have this amazing value. I, I I mean, I was blessed that it's taught me all the life skills and the character development. Um, but but I'm just a part of a bigger team. Um, as I said, I'm a conduit. The kids inspired the Companions Encourage Foundation. I've got an amazing board. You mentioned Carl and. Uh, and, and Jimmy, uh, you. Awesome. you know, we've got Dr. Lovechuck, uh, um, who's amazing doctor. One of, greatest, one of the greatest heart doctors, one of the best heart doctors around. 
John Love, Chuck, Dr. George, uh, or George Ross, um, who's on The Apprentice and was Donald Trump's lawyer. He's, he's an amazing humanitarian and, and, philanthropy and, and, and philanthropist. Um, we've got Rich Pluta, Jerry Wood, who's on Long Island here. Uh, Diane Rohde, who is actually one of the child life. She's in charge of the hospital right there in Mount Sinai um, and, and is a part of helping to you know, grow what CIC is doing. You said something very interesting you know, earlier. Uh, Rich Pluta also is a gentleman, I think I mentioned, who's been tremendous. We've got a great board, but we also have friends of the foundation who have supported us you know, over those 20 years. Um, but you said something about technology and trying to get in front and you know, think about where we would be today with, without what you're doing, without creating awareness, without creating connectivity and connection and um, experiences. I mean, I, I, I really feel fortunate that if we didn't have the technology, we weren't able to connect. And this goes back to 2001 when um, we had Edwin Schlossberg, who was our um, environmental designer, created these spaces called lion's den rooms, which are really special. The walls curve in, the tiles change colors. Um, it makes a kid feel like he's in a futuristic space. Not, not in a, a hospital. Not in a hospital. And that child is able to connect to his teacher, his hero, his parents. The parents get to watch the child play video games, smile and laugh. And for, for us, you know, this was something he said, a long time ago, they're going to be uh, they're going to be communication hubs that help heal children and families, and and this was way back in two thousand and one. And here wow, we are giving me goosebumps, man. <laughs> here we are in two thousand and twenty, and um, you know when we when we do the numbers, and Jim Johnson's our executive director and and the heart and soul, and helps the day to day, and just does an amazing job when he lets us all know that we're impacting 60,000 kids a year for a long period of time, you know, it goes back to the, you know, the, the, the positive sides of technology, the positive sides of the internet, the teaching, yeah. the, the giving kids that opportunity. And one of the things, and one of the stories I, I'll share with you that was probably the most touching was we, we introduced the technology and the kiosks that we rolled in with Microsoft in one of the lion's den rooms there was a boy named Connor playing on the game and his mom was watching and we just did an unveiling of the room and the kiosk that we were, uh, in fact, I think it was seven years ago, well, it's 10 years ago yesterday or seven years ago uh, anniversary. But um, anyway, he, he played and he just was mesmerized. And a lot of times you go into these rooms, these kids are, they're mesmerized, they're distracted. And his mom turned to Jimmy Johnson and, and she started crying. And, he, he looked at her and she said, are you okay? And she said, yeah. She said, you know, my son presses his morphine button because he's in pain and he does it every nine minutes because I check, I watch him. He's been in this room playing that video game for the last 50 minutes and he hasn't pressed his button once. She said, that's the best hour of my day. And so, you know, when we talk about what people are going through and the sacrifices they're making, you know, it's, it's, it's really the heroes. It's the frontline nurses and doctors and 9-11, obviously the firemen and the police. And, you know, it, it just goes to show there's heroes all around us. And um, we feel very fortunate and the kids were the inspiration, but to just be a small part and a conduit to try to give them some relief, to distract them, to maybe put a smile on their faces, their parents' faces. They're going through this 24 seven and the yeah. Companions, yeah, Companions of Courage Foundation is this there to support them that no child in the fight for life and health should ever have to go through it alone. That's our, our mission statement. Yeah. I mean, it, it's awesome. I mean, you know, um, my mom raised six kids on her own. Uh, she was a nurse. What's crazy is we just had to find some documents. Um, my mom's, my mom turned 93 in September and wow. uh, medical issues and she's still with it and everything. But, um, we found her nursing records where she went into the nursing corps, which is basically the, for the army in World War II at age 17. And, uh, you know, I look at that and it's like, wow, um, you know, what these, what these nurses and these doctors are doing. So as 
As something going kind of off the page a little bit, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to do a bonus episode. I just got Nick Fitterman, who's the CEO of Huntington Hospital. Nick's going to come on. We're going to do a special show with him to talk about what these nurses and doctors and, and what they're going through and also talk about Nick and you know the leadership that he's bringing to the table right now and, and also talk about the people that are helping. I mean, the Huntington, the Huntington community um, alone has raised over $150,000 um, for meals and to take care of the nurses and the doctors and the maintenance people and the, the ambulance drivers and everyone um, who, who are doing going through this. And um, it's just simply amazing. So we're going to go off script a little bit and not have something about sports, although Nick does like to play golf. Hey, I'll share a quick story too, Dave. Um, one of our friends of the foundation was Clark Gillies, who's a huge, you know, benefactor and donates to. Listen, Huntington, Huntington Hospital, Hospital Emergency Room and the entire pediatric emergency room, it's because of Clark Gillies. So Clark obviously is a dear friend and a teammate and part of what we've done back a while ago now, obviously, uh, God bless uh, Brianna Titcomb. Uh, both Clarky and I have daughters I named coach Brianna. You. Yeah, it's a special, you know, God bless her and uh, her, her courage and her inspiration. Clarkie and I both have daughters named Brianna. We came together and we did our very first cub room, which is a smaller version of the lion's den room. And uh, we put it in Huntington Hospital in the pediatric ward. And we, we, we dedicated it to, to Brianna. We, we were there with her mom and dad. And so uh, her legacy lives on. Uh, in the pediatric area and Clarky was uh, a friend of the foundation and we both uh, we did it and that's one of our rooms it's 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 the only cub room we call it the cub room because it's a little bit smaller but it has all the same pieces and components and technology and it's right there here in our in our town and you're so that's right awesome. about Huntington and Cold Spring Harbor um, it's amazing how everybody comes together uh, and really helps families and and, and everybody and people in need. Yeah, I mean, you know, you just, it's almost like one thing connected to another. You think of, uh, you know, I think of Brianna. I coached Brianna um, in ice hockey, and um, she was a tremendous soccer player. And Breezy Park in Huntington, yep. um, you know, everyone will say, oh, I'm going to Breezy Park. Well, Breezy Park is named after Brianna. That was her nickname, Breezy. And the statue that's right out in front is actually taken from a picture of her kicking a soccer ball. And, um, you know, great kid. And I, it's funny, I remember she was um, Tony McCann, um, it, Tony. you know, great, great hockey player. And uh, Tony said one time, he said, one of the hardest hits he'd ever seen in youth hockey was when Brianna Titcomb actually laid out a boy at the blue line and almost sent them over the boards. And I'm I, like, yeah, that's how she I played. Can, I, can, I can believe that, Dave. Both my yeah. daughters played with her and I coached and I remember um, – her and Brianna and Sarah, we were riding to one of the games and just, just laughing in the back, uh, as we all know, those trips to, to certain hockey games. But uh, she was special, and she was a tremendous athlete. Well, let's, let's take it back. Um, let's say it back. You know, it's funny. I was actually thinking about it. Um, you were my daughter Victoria's first ever hockey coach um, playing right. at the Little Club. And, and I gotta, was Peter Laviolette also coaching with you back then? He wasn't then. I think he came a little bit just after. Because we, uh, we, as you know, the barn, we put the barn, we built yeah. the barn. And uh, we, we, uh, we were members for a couple of years, so I think it came just after. Okay, so I mean, here, you know, it's kind of crazy. We had Pat LaFontaine as a coach, and we had Peter Laviolette as a coach. Not too shabby. Um, and I remember the time, Victoria and, and Eleanor Haynes were the only two players on an all-boys team with, with uh, your son, Dan. And... Um, you know, Victoria went on to play college lacrosse, and then Eleanor went on to play college hockey for Syracuse. But, um, you know, what's interesting is getting back to your youth, um, were your parents athletes? My dad, my dad was. My mom wasn't uh, so much of an athlete. Um, um, my dad uh, played hockey. He was actually born in Windsor to come see in, in Canada. Um, he had seven brothers, and so they had a lot of uh, family chores and a lot of family work to do. And um, I don't well, think they had they a full always... team with a sub. <laughs> they could. I don't think they had uh, the wherewithal to play travel hockey back then. He played a little bit of high school, uh, and then my father, um, you know, married my mom, who was from in Farmington, Michigan. So uh, he became obviously an American and was. 
uh, started uh, as a foreman on the line with Chrysler in St. Louis. And that's how I was born in St. Louis. So he uh, loved hockey. Um, and then you moved to Detroit, right? And then we moved to Detroit when I was seven years old. But, uh, you know, my father, I, I feel very lucky and blessed that my parents, they never, you know, you hear the stories today about, you know, pressure on kids. And my, my dad, I never heard him yell or he always said, you know, work on your weaknesses. If you're good on your strengths, you know, you know, focus, you can still, you know, you're going to be good on them. You know, you're going to still do them, but, but work on your weaknesses. If you're good on the right side, you know, crossing over, work on your left side, you work, you get on your wrist shot, work on your backhand. And uh, he says, it's all about balance and being a well-rounded athlete. And, uh, and, and I think well-rounded person. So, um, but I never seen him yell. Um, I, I instinctively realized that if somebody really wants it, it has to be within themselves. And coaches are, you know, they're, they're teachers. Um, they, they motivate, they inspire, they give, you know, X's and O's and skills and teach skills and all that. But at the end of the day, it really comes from within uh, that player. Coaches have a chance to push buttons and maybe inspire, but at the end of the day, um, it, 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 you just have to really want it. And so um, it's interesting because I was very lucky that my dad was a coach a, a lot of times during my life. Um, and, and sports is so important. I, I just wanted to mention too, you mentioned Donnie Saladino and, and Joe Saladino, you know, talk about. Well, Don, by the way, do you know why Donnie wears number 16? <laughs> he wears you number know, 16 because of you. Well, those guys are amazing uh, people and athletes. Uh, but their family too. Talk about giving back to the community. Yeah, uh, there's Saladino so many foundation and everything they've done for North Shore LIJ. It's incredible. So many great examples, and I think one of the greatest things you know, I always I find out there's four ways you can really change people. You have to love them, you have to support and care for them, you have to be a, a great example, and then you have to be patient. And uh, you know, in the community we live in, we're very, we're very fortunate, and blessed, and, and and Long Island in general is, you know, it's it's a caring community, and uh, there's a lot of great examples that are all around us, and uh, everybody can do something, and everybody can give something back, whatever that is. It's, I always was told too, it's 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 not how much, it's 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 in the spirit and giving. If it's equal, if everybody gives equally, and the spirit of wanting to give and support, it all matters. Right. You know, it, it's interesting. You know, you talk about your dad coaching you and then, um, you know, you had the opportunity to, you know, coach Dan, your son, and you coached them to a national championship with the Royals. And what was really cool about it was you guys had NHL films following you around. And um, what was the actual title of the documentary? Was it like the making of a Royal? Yeah, right on. Spot on. So if anyone wants to go back in, I think there's 24 episodes. Um, it, it really is, uh, is a whole season of uh, what it means to be a royal, royal, the making of a royal. So the letters royals, we is respect, um, optimism, youthfulness, all together, uh, loyalty, and uh, sacrifice. And so what was important, Steve Webb, obviously a great islander. Another great islander. He sacrificed two years uh, before he had his own children. And he told me, you know, the game was good to him. There were two or three guys back in Peterborough when he was ready to hang up his skates um, that actually pulled him aside and helped him and worked with him. And he says, you know, if it wasn't for those guys and all my coaches, I would have never made it. So I want to pay it forward. And he sacrificed two years of being the assistant coach. And uh, it's people like that. And so, we put together a plan, but most importantly, our goals were to, number one, create uh, good young men, gentlemen, and, and human beings. Number two, um, better teammates. And number three, better hockey players. And it was in that order. And the amazing thing was when you put character values first and you put life skills and sacrifice and all the, you know, values that we want our kids to learn, it's amazing how the other stuff follows. Um, you're, you're, and, you're, you're 100% right. I, I got asked the question. I was on a podcast recently and someone asked the question. It said, you know, you have, uh, you really cranked out a ton of leaders in, you know, the women's college lacrosse game. You know, you have so many girls who are captains of their teams. And, you know, what is it all about? And I said the same thing. I said, if you start out with a great kid, you know, from a great family, the rest, and they're willing to work hard, the rest will take care of itself. 
But, you know, if you have a kid who's got, you know, problems, they got attitude issues, and, you know, that's why we created the NAZ, the no a-hole zone. You know, we just have no time for that. You know, uh, parents, kids, doesn't matter. You know, we want great kids from great families. And, you know, it sounds exactly like how you started it with, you know, the Royals. Well, you know, it's true. And, and we, we want to create the right environment, create environment and structure for success. And we, we actually had some, we had four, four single moms. Uh, we had five hardship cases. Uh, but it was a creating a culture. And um, it's actually really neat. In fact, now that we're talking about, uh, well, since we've been isolated, um, if somebody wants to go back in the sports world, there's, like I said, it's making of a Royal. Some of them are five, six minutes. They're on YouTube. And then Dennis Leary, who, you know, came out into the playing for the Roxbury Rippers uh, men's team that's playing at the Winter Club in the Long Island, uh, the, the Huntington Low Tides. Um, he actually did the voiceover for the final two episodes, his passion for hockey, but it really is trials and tribulations, ups and downs, the sacrifices teams go through. And it's really based on character development and life skills that, you know, as a parent, when, when it's all said and done, Dave, what's most important to us as parents, um, we can talk about the winning and the losing and all that stuff. But, but what we want is our kids to be, uh, happy, successful, and well-rounded. And, and sports really, you know, outside of the home and school has a chance to really instill those values and, and be a vehicle to give those kids the tools they need to be successful and happy, you know, and well-rounded. I think that's, that's a narrative we need to change in sports. It's, it's great if you can be a byproduct and get that one-tenth of one percent and maybe make it to the pros. If you can get a college scholarship, 2% and 1% paid for. But 100% of athletes should all get the great values and life skills and character development that sports gives you. And, and the narrative needs to shift because at the end of the day, that's what we really want as parents. I think we just found our Elevate Academy spokesperson. <laughs> that's exactly well, it's, what it's, it's, it's transferable. Uh, it's repeatable. It's scalable. It's for any sport. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's exactly what this is all about. You know, um, you know what, what's interesting, too, is a lot of the connections that you have, that even with some of the fundraisers and things that you're doing for Companions and Courage, in order to get more of, the, more of this technology inside of hospitals, you've been doing that through sport as well. You know, um, how many triathlons have you done now? Well, you know, it's funny. I don't get asked that question very often, but I've done six Ironmen. Six uh, Ironmen. So everyone, that's, that's, that's the big one. That's 112 <laughs> miles on a bike, 26.2 mile run, and a 2.4 mile swim? Yep. Yeah, oh, spot man. on. You're going to laugh, Dave, but, uh, you know, the kind community and uh, the friends of the foundation back in 2004, um, I made a promise to myself when I retired. I watched a nun and a priest finish in under 16 hours, 17 hours, in the dark and the nun was 66 and the priest was 71 and i said before i'm 40 i'm gonna do this i promised myself and if you can't keep a promise to yourself who can you keep one to right so um i signed up at 39 and a half <laughs> and uh pete smith myself and uh um bob d'angelo we the three of us did it and we raised i think it was close to sixty five thousand dollars and uh which was amazing. And Jim Johnson came to me afterwards. He said, I got good news and bad news. I said, well, give me the good news. He said, well, we raised $65,000 for the kids in CIC. Bad news is you're going to do it next year. <laughs> <laughs> so That's I ended great. up doing five of them in six years. And then, you know, we've done. You've uh, done bike like rides. 50, right? You've done 50, bike 15, rides out to yeah. Montauk. We had the Montauk Rough Riders, uh, a bunch of buddies. I know Carl and Jimmy and uh, a lot of local guys, our buddies from the Huntington Low Tides uh, and friends of the foundation. Bobby Nystrom's done it before, his son, Steve Webb. But we, uh, we ride 100 miles and we raise money uh, from Babylon to Montauk. We've done about 15 of those. Uh, Long Island marathons, we did, I think, about 12 of those. Um, right. We do a Main Street mile uh, right down in Farmingdale. Um, we, uh, Bob Cook from Runner's Edge and, uh, you know, Mark Leff, uh, those, his group uh, puts together this amazing um, run we do. I think it's 15 years now, the Main Street Mile right downtown Farmingdale. So, and we have our golf outing at Huntington Country Club. They do a fantastic job. So, as you can see, um, I was always taught when, 
you know, once again, I couldn't do that if I was trying to do it for myself, Dave. Right. I mean, sure. honestly, the only thing that kept me going was we had a philosophy. It was an easy day. Being a, being a child stuck in a room, you know, scared, not knowing what's going on with his life or health. That's a tough day. We always said, this is an easy day. Let's figure out how we can raise money and help these kids. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, um, there's a hashtag that's going around. My daughter's at UNC uh, playing lacrosse for University of North Carolina, and they have a hashtag called We Get To, and it's about a coach here on Long Island who passed away, um, DZ. And um, it's also DZ Strong is the charity. And, and one of the things is it's that, you know, he said it, he's like, I don't want to have to do things. He goes, we get to do things. And it's that mindset of, you know, hey, this is a tough practice right now. We got it ready for a big game, but we get to do this. Not all kids yeah, do it. Great. You know, it's, you know not- what, it's, it's, it's a blessing that we even have the opportunity, like you said. I have a nice yeah. quote that I live by too. Um, Gratitude is the aristocrat to attitude. You know, so it's, it's uh, we're very blessed and lucky. Um, not all of us have that, uh, you know, that blessing of being able to do something that can make a difference. Um, and especially like kids and, and what you're saying to you know, DZ to be able to, you know, we get the opportunity. Not everybody gets a chance and why not take advantage of that opportunity to make a difference? Just like we're yeah. doing, our, our, our world is coming together. I mean, everything in life is you learn through adversity, you learn through the most difficult situations. And we were stronger and better out of 9-11, a lot of heartbreak and sadness. And there's a lot of heartbreak and sadness now. And uh, it's, it's really coming together. And uh, there's, there continues to be these life lessons. And fortunately, catastrophes or tsunamis of health, et cetera, tsunamis in general. But, um, but they're, they're opportunities to learn and to, to make things better and to pass things on and make it better for the next generation. And uh, it's a scary world we're living in. We're in uncharted territory right now. And wow, to be a, somebody on the front lines, like a, a healthcare worker, um, you know, my hat's off. It's just amazing um, what they had to go through and are going through right now. Yeah, well, you know, yesterday we, we, uh, we go to Huntington Hospital at 645 pretty much every, every single night. And we're beeping the horns and holding up signs for the nurses and doctors and the frontline workers there. And uh, one of my assistant coaches, she came last night with her two daughters and, and brought them there. And one thing she said, she said, you know, I can handle this, but it's hard. It's really hard for the kids. And because, you know, they're not able to see their friends and everything. And in, as, as she was saying this, I'm like, it is, it is hard for the kids. But then I was like, and tomorrow I get to talk to Pat LaFontaine, who's really talking about kids who, who have it hard and, and, and what he's doing. So, you know, hats off again to you, Pat. You know, it's just amazing. But um, bringing this back to, you know, what the Elevate Academy really is all about. It's like, you know, it's taking my 40 plus years of sports and work and everything and, and trying to make the road easier for the kids who are buying us, paying it forward. You know, you, I, I remember one time you and I were talking, we were out on the rink and, um, and you were talking about creativity and being, you know, a creative player. And something you said, oh my God, it stuck with me forever. I talk about it all the time. You said, I learned my creativity on the pond. I didn't learn it at practice. I didn't learn it when a coach was telling me to do something. And I think one of the things that we need to do more of as coaches is let kids play. Leave them alone. Yeah, you're spot on. Um... I give a lot of credit to the team that had success. They would come over to the barn, the outdoor out, outdoor rink. And, so let uh, me explain this to everyone. So Pat put in a <laughs> rink at his house that was called the barn and um, had a little, little mini Zamboni and everything. And Pat would wear a little construction helmet because you always have to be safe when he'd go around on, on, on the Zamboni, cleaning the ice. And, and that's the barn. And, and usually it's like three on three. Grand three hockey. It was a, uh, it was a special place. I was a rink of dreams. I call it. Um, it, 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 uh, it really promotes uh, reaction. I think we're talking about just playing because, you know, so much is scripted today. So much is robotic. Um, go up there, do this, cut across here, make this. And, you know, when you're a kid 
and we were all growing up on the pond. You know, my idol was, I had two idols. It was Guy Lafleur and uh, Gilbert Perrault, because they used to be able to take the, the, we call it coast to coast, like buttered toast. They could take the puck all the way down, and, yeah. and, and Guy's hair would be flying because they didn't wear helmets back then. Um, but we all wanted to be Bobby Orr or Guy Lafleur or Gilbert Perrault or some athlete in any sport. And it's those moments that you're not thinking, you're reacting. And if you don't allow these kids to have natural reaction tendencies and quick twitch fibers that just happen, because if you ask somebody to think about doing something, it actually takes a split second longer. Yeah. And so to mix the two together, um, make, a, make a huge, I think, difference in what kids don't have. And, you know, there's one of the things I'm a big um, – all blacks rugby fan you know oh, there's a great there's a great book and there's a great book called legacy and 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 legacy and the, and the captain's class as well they talk about him in the captain's class a lot <laughs> well just um just to quote one of the gentlemen who talked about in the book and he just said you know to be a true servant and a leader of your sport and your game you want you you want and aspire to want to leave it better than you found it Right. And Dave, I think Dave, what you're doing is, is you're taking, you know, all of the things, the character development, the life skills, the experiences, the joys, the highs, the, you know, the, the, the learning adversity pieces. And you're just trying to say, Hey, listen, I, I owe this sport so much and I want to give my wisdom back and I want to pass that on to the next generation. And, and that's what we all should be doing in all sports. So my, my hat's off to you because Going back to what you just talked about, if we're going to make the kids of the next generation really enjoy the experience, they have to just play and just right. react. Yeah. Well, talking about playing, obviously, I mean, you put up some ridiculous numbers. I, well, you know, in, in, obviously, I've known you for a long time, but I, I went and I actually did some research and I was looking at it. I, I couldn't believe you only played one year of juniors, right? Yep. In so, Montreal. In that one year of juniors, you absolutely exploded and put up some ridiculous numbers. You, I think the funny thing is, I think the award that you won was like the Mike Bossy Award. I did. I, you know, it's funny. I mentioned Gila Fleur earlier. So I, Mike Bossy had the record for goals as a rookie. And uh, he had 70 goals at the time. And I didn't know I was going to be playing a teammate of his, you know, almost a year later. Um, but Gila Fleur actually had the consecutive scoring record of 41 games in a row and somehow I got very lucky with a really good team um, I left home from Michigan at 17 I skipped my senior year and all my friends were like what are you doing going to play hockey in Montreal what's wrong with you yeah and uh, I was able to score consecutively in the first 44 games and that's how I met my hero Guy Lafleur was that he actually came on the ice to shake my hand because of the record. So I have a photograph of my mom and dad. They flew them into Montreal. I'm 17. And I get to meet my idol, Guy Lafleur, at center ice before the game, shake his hand, um, which can you imagine at 17 what that was for a young American kid? Can't even imagine. I mean, you know, incredible. I, I was always a Guy Lafleur fan too. Uh, but, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm actually one of the unique ones. People say to me, like, you know, who, who are you? An Islander fan or a Ranger fan? I said – I'm actually a New York fan. So I go Islanders first, Rangers second. So whenever the Islanders and Rangers are playing, I'm always rooting for the Islanders. Um, otherwise, I root for the Rangers. And I actually watch the Devils too, so I'm a huge hockey fan. Giants first, Jets second, and then Yankees first, Mets second. And then I'm not a huge I'm not a huge pro basketball fan, so that doesn't really matter to me. But <laughs> um, but it's funny. I, I, I love all the teams. So, you know, um, and you got to play on, on, on all those. But – I do want to talk a little bit about you putting on the Team USA jersey for the first time. What was that like? Well, that was amazing because, you know, it wasn't, it just, we just celebrated 40 years. Um, I was turning 15 the night of my 15th birthday. Um, Aruzioni scores the winning goal and the miracle oh. against the Russians. So we're eating Little Caesars pizza in Waterford, Michigan, jumping around like a bunch of kids. And, um, all of a sudden, it gave boys and girls a chance to dream bigger. And not that, you know, college wasn't big. <laughs> and, you know, 
I, in my wildest dreams. So, so fast forward about three months, it's, it's, it's our four months, it's May. And my dad would always, you know, we'd be doing spring cleaning and we were out, you know, raking whatever leaves that we didn't get in the fall and just cleaning up. And he yells and he says, Hey, the Islanders are in overtime. You got to come in and watch this. So my brother and I run in. And um, so this is all within five months. And sure enough, Lauren Henney makes a pass to John Tonelli, John Tonelli to Tonelli Bobby nice job. And here's a 15 year old kid. My brother was 16 jumping up and down, watching the Islanders win their first Stanley Cup. And the first thing that popped in my mind was, where, where, where the heck's Long Island? And I remember going, I was like, there it is. And the Islanders, you know, put Long Island on the map. Now, fast forward three more years, and I got the, the blessing of representing my country in the 1984 Olympics right after the 1980 Olympics. And, and it was the greatest experience. Know. It wasn't even the, the two weeks in a foreign country, Sarajevo, which still gives me chills when they, they had the, the opening and watching and hearing your national anthem and the flag, uh, the United States flag. There's never a, a greater, more proud feeling. I always tell kids, if you have a chance to play the Olympics, go for it because it's, it's a rare opportunity. But I had that wonderful chance, and it was the six months leading up to it where we traveled all over the world as an 18 year old and and um and got to experience that which was one of the, the the highlights of my life but right after that a week later i joined the islanders just turning 19 and would you believe my first face off after you know playing in the 84 olympic teams i turned to my right and there's bobby nystrom and i turned to my left and there's john tonelli Come now on. if you if you could have ever asked um if you could have ever asked um, somebody if that would happen, I thought you would be crazy. Uh, but in my wildest dreams, and they were dreams, uh, they, they came true. And, uh, you know, here I am. I was fortunate enough. And another assist I, I often talk about is Lauren Henning, who made the first pass to Tonelli and to Nystrom. He and his wife actually assisted on introducing me on a blind date to my wife today of 33 years, Mary Beth Hoey at the time, who's from Huntington. So, um, obviously, there's there's a whole Long Island connection. And, uh, Did Mary Beth go to Holy Trinity? She went to Huntington High School. Oh, she went to Huntington. Okay. Small world, but um, dream oh, big. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's unbelievable. And, and, and you know, it, it, it's awesome. Listen, you are the best. I, I appreciate this so much. We're going to wrap this up with our final three questions here. So okay. the first question is actually asked from our prior guest. So... The prior guest is Don Saladino. And Don Saladino, his, his question of you was, as nice of a guy you are, you're also super competitive and you love to win. What was it like when you left hockey and you went into the front office role? Were you able to bring that competitiveness to the front office? And if so, how did you do it? Yeah, no, that's a great question from Donnie. Um, I was very lucky. Uh, Cam Neely told me when I first retired, don't, don't jump into something too quickly. Right. And I said, well, tell me why. And he says, well, I retired a couple of years before you. And six months later, I woke up and I was, I was doing about five or six different things. It was like I was playing a hockey game. And he goes, just kind of decompress. Right. You know, we, we lived a high-level career right. for 15 years, and we compressed it into a short period of time. And your body and your mind it was at a high level. So just so that that was great advice. So I kind of just decompressed for a little bit, and I actually didn't go in the office right away. Um, I got into a renovation business. I wrote a book. I started a foundation. I, I wanted to make sure I could be around uh, for the kids. Uh, the renovation business was awesome. Uh, I learned a lot about architecture. Going back to creativity, I said, you know, hockey players, athletes, are in general um, are creative. They just don't really know it because we're visual a lot of times people will say you know you're either auditory or you're visual but most athletes are visual 90 percent of athletes see things and watch things and i always jokingly say i made a living you know knowing where the puck was going to go next yeah well, but that's also life life is about kind of anticipating things preparing for things but having a feel and the creativity pays a big role um but i will tell you that the thing you miss the most is laughing and being with the guys and your teammates and just actually being on the ice. You don't miss, you don't miss the, the injuries. You don't miss the travel, the politics, the games, the intensity all the time. 
And I have to tell you that one of the greatest gifts I got, you know, received when I retired was the, the outdoor rink that was built, not only for my kids, um, but it allowed me still to laugh with the guys and, and family members and then watch the kids, you know, have experiences. And, um, you know, th- I got to really play until I was over 50 and I just recently retired. So, um, and, and then going whoa, 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 whoa. Did we just hear that right? You recently <laughs> retired from the low tides? How does well, that no, happen? No, no, I'm, I'm still playing with the low tides. So okay, still, all right, all right. But 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 uh, the the barn the barn it was time to retire from the barn because I can tell you, taking care of a rink is a lot of work too. Absolutely, uh, especially outdoor ice. But to answer in a long 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 question here, but um, it it was an adjustment. Um, fortunately, I had passions that I wanted to be there for, and. I had to learn how to stick handle. I think I learned, did more stick handling in five years off the ice than I did in 45 years on the ice. It's a different world. And, and it gave me a greater appreciation for those types of sacrifices. I did find out that I, I'm more comfortable and more creative at times away from a desk. Um, but I found ways where I could contribute uh, and it took a different discipline. So, you know, Donnie, it's, it's a great question because it was definitely an adjustment. Well, to talk about creativity, just so everyone understands this, I will tell you what it's like when you are a defenseman and you're skating backwards and Pat LaFontaine is coming at you and all these trick stops and everything does where they, they put the puck on their stick and they take the lacrosse shot. Well, Pat took the puck, put it on his stick, flipped it over my head, skated around me, caught it on the other side of me, put it down, and then passed it right to someone's stick where all they had to do was literally tap it into the net. And I just turned around and said, did that just happen? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it happens. <laughs> well, luckily, I never got on a lacrosse field with you, Dave. So, I mean... Yeah, I would have slashed you. I definitely <laughs> okay. would have slashed you. I've slashed a lot of people. But, uh, <laughs> the next question I have for you is a question that you're going to have for our next guest. So our next guest is actually uh, – an ESP announcer. He's kind of heads the lacrosse side of ESPN is Paul Carcaterra. So um, he's our next guest on Monday. So what is your question for Paul Carcaterra? Uh, yeah, no, I would ask Paul um, what technologies, innovations that Paul, what are they looking at? Um, you know, I, I guess the question would be kind of post COVID um what is going on in our world today to to still create um the experience for the fan uh in lacrosse and still evolve the game um it's well, a challenging you, one, thing, one thing that paul's doing is, i tell you right now and I'm, I'm sure i'll talk about it he's done he's done some incredible podcasts recently with some of the best players and uh he and he also he's also does a lot of um espn football so I, i'm going to be asking him is like hey, are we going to have football this fall? Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are up in the air. So that's going to be a great question for him. I appreciate it. So last question um, and, and get you out of here. Once again, Elevate Academy is all about making a difference in, in people's lives, not just student athletes. It's the coaches who are watching. It's, you know, parents who are watching who could take something away from, hey, wow, Pat was, a, you know, a coach of his own kid and I could learn something from that. What's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten and who gave it to you? Oh, wow. I mean, uh, that's hard to put it on one. It is. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I've been very lucky. I mean, I had Al Arbor as a, a, as a head coach. Um, you know, the Tory boys, uh, the Suns yeah. are winter club guys. Uh, the late, great Bill Tory, the late, great Al Arbor, you know. Um, the architect. The, the architect. Um, you know, extremely influential. Teddy Nolan was, you know, an amazing coach for me. My dad, uh, family, you know, I'll, I'll, um, you know, I remember one of them early on, um, and I'll, I'll give this to my wife. Uh, when we were dating before we got engaged, I remember, you know, I was, I was an American coming in, breaking in. And back then, there weren't that many. And yeah. it was predominantly a Canadian sport. And even Europeans were trying to break into the game. And um, the one thing I can tell you was it wasn't handed. It, it was, you know, you had to earn it. I think the World Cup victory in 96 was really important because um, we had to prove it. I mean, 
when you would talk to them, well, the, the Olympics in 1980, that was a fluke, that was amateurs, you know, best on best. And when we put together a team in 96, and their four centermen were Gretzky, Messier, Eiserman, and Sakic, <laughs> and we have to win two out of three and two of them in Montreal, and we lose the first one. Once we came back, that changed all of hockey. And um, so early on, it was kind of un like un unheard of. You just kind of, you know, and Flats and I came in at the same time. And, you know, you had to prove yourself. And I remember my wife just saying, um, you know, because you, you felt the pressure because you wanted to fit in. You wanted to be a part of the team. And just like every kid goes through or every teammate goes through, you want to be a part of it. And uh, she just said in a real – real simple way you know I said you know I'm just trying to want to be a part of this and you're working hard and I was young I was just 19 and she said D don't try to change who you are for anybody else just be yourself and they'll learn to like you just give it time and I never thought about that you know because there's pressures on trying to fit in and trying to be you know into the team and all this and people want you to do certain things that maybe you're not comfortable and you know what? It was one of the greatest pieces of advice because just be yourself. Just be what, who you are, you know, your values, your morals, your, you know, and, and it, surprisingly people, you know, they'll learn to like you for your, your, your humility and your authenticity. And uh, I think when you talk about leadership and sports, two of the great, great character traits are really vulnerability and humility. And, um, Anyway, that was a great piece of advice for me. And then as I got older, I would, the only thing I would say to you now is, is for all those athletes and parents and, and kids to, you know, score your goals when you're young and, and have set your sights high and, and just enjoy the experience and just try to be the best you can be. And because when you score your goals when you're young, you realize in life when you get older, it's not about the goals. It's really about the assists. And uh, for me in my life, I was very blessed to have scored some pretty cool goals. And I had great teammates who set me up. But I have to tell you. Um, and a lot more assists. Watching and being an assist guy, the assists are what life is all about. And watching somebody else score their goals is much more meaningful. Uh, well, you know what? You just kill me with the goosebumps today because that one just got me again. <laughs> you know, it's amazing because um, – you know, that is who you are. And it's funny because I, I think that one thing I wish more sports would, would take on is the hockey assist. And it's, it's not the, it's not, you know, in lacrosse, you only have the person who gave it to the, the last person. And it's, you know, sometimes you don't even get an assist in lacrosse if the person makes a move, but it's the player before the player two plays away from that goal who dug it out, dug that puck out of the corner and made the great play, got it to someone else who made the e maybe the easy pass. And you've done that your whole life. You're doing that now. You're assisting all these kids, thousands and thousands of kids. Pat, can't thank you enough. This has just been unbelievable for me, unbelievable for our listeners. Uh, you elevated me today. So I appreciate, I appreciate you and, just keep doing the things you're doing and, and just well, keep being the leader that you are. Thanks, Dave. And listen, congratulations to you. And thanks for all your service and uh, for doing this and for, for giving back and making the game of lacrosse better than, uh, better than when you found it. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's great to talk to a friend and just keep up the great work and uh, great, great seeing you and great being on. Hey, Pat, thanks again, bud. This is the Elevate Academy. We'll see you guys on Monday with Paul Carcaterra. Thanks again, Pat. Have a great weekend, buddy. Stay safe, Thanks, everyone. Too. Take care.